Good morning. It's so good to see you and welcome to you online. Wonderful to be back here to share what I believe the Lord has put on my heart. Wow, it's been quite a summer, hasn't it, in many ways. But what I want to share with you is this book. I mean, we've been reading magazines, we've been looking on TV, we've been doing so many things through the summer. But this book is actually a miracle. It really is. Do you know that it is the most influential book in the whole of human history? It is a bestseller, the bestseller. There's over five billion copies of the Bible that have been published over the years. And this book has shaped cultures. It has influenced millions of people's lives over centuries in all four corners of the world. It is being translated into over 3,000 languages. They say that about 90% of the world has the Bible in their language. There's still more to come. This was the very first book that was ever published. Old Gutenberg, with his printing press in 1455, printed the Bible. Because this was what was urging him to get out more than anything else. The Bible. When you think about it, it's actually 66 books put into one. It's like a library in itself. It was written over about 1,500 years by more than 40 different authors, kings, fishermen, a tax collector, a doctor, a shepherd, scholars, prophets. Extraordinary. Breathed by God. And you know how we realize that more and more when we get into it? When you think of the different people who wrote, the different circumstances they wrote in, it's extraordinary that there's one message that pulsates through all these books of the Bible, and that is God's love, (laughs) God's amazing love for us, for each one of us. It's a love more than we can ever begin to understand. Unconditional, no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done. He loves you. He loves you with such passion that he can't keep anybody quiet. <laughs> they print it, they publish it, they, they've even died with this book. That's how important it is. The love of God pulsates through the pages. And I often think when I read the Bible, it's like a symphony. You've heard me say that before. When I'm reading it, some of the pages are like these deep cellos or basses. They're mournful where people have just gone astray. Sometimes it's like sweet flute music that just pipes through. It's trickling hope. Sometimes it's crashing cymbals and loud drums and belting guitars because In everything, God is drawing us to closer intimacy with himself, to oneness with himself in a loving relationship. So there are many different themes in the Bible, but the key theme is love. I've called this talk today Deeper Still, because I really want to, my life, to be deeper and deeper into his word, but more than that, into him through the Holy Spirit. And I really pray that you will join me today as we go deeper and deeper still and unpack some of the key themes in Scripture, but in all of it, be aware. It's not just about words on a page. It's not just about words that are spoken. It's about a oneness of heart with the living God himself in the most extraordinary, beautiful way. Come, he says, come to me. Let me love you. Let me love you more than you've ever been loved before. And he does it in many different ways. I'm going to look at three key themes through the Bible. And that is amazing. You'll you'll recognize them there through all the chapters of the Bible. The garden, the tree, and the river that we've sung about. These are interwoven themes through Scripture. But they are key themes, and I really feel an urgency 
that in these days of chaos, disruption, wars, rumors of wars, total confusion, the Lord is coming soon and we need to be ready as his people with an intensity of heart and purpose. Why does he keep repeating those three themes over and over and over again? Three different speakers, different writers, different experiences, because he wants us to get that message. Let's look at a couple of these. They're, they're repeated a few times, and we're going to go through just snippets of them because of time. But I really believe he wants us to sit up and take note. Why is the garden so important, the tree and the river? Let's look first at the garden. Well, we know that the Bible story begins in Genesis with the creation story, and it ends in the book of Revelation with the creation story. It's amazing that between these pages, there's about 4,000 years of recorded history. It's incredible. But it's the same theme. When you think that Moses probably wrote Genesis, he was well educated in the palace of the Pharaoh, and he might have written that in Sinai, that's what scholars think. And there's John, the disciple that Jesus loved. He kept saying he loved even me. Exiled in Patmos, writing almost word for word. It's quite chilling, the same thing. And that is this creation story of love. We have a physical, earthly paradise at the beginning, and we have a heavenly, spiritual paradise at the end with the same beautiful ingredients. Into the chaos, God spoke order and beauty. And I love that because as we dig deeper still, we realize he's doing that every day. He's doing it in my life in the chaos of moments when I sometimes just feel deep despair or disillusionment or disappointment. When I get into his word, he speaks order and beauty. And what does he do? He has a garden and he puts man in the garden in his own image. And I think, Lord, do that in my situation now. Transform me into your image more and more. It's an ongoing, beautiful, beautiful transformation. So in the beginning, he spoke, and there was order, beauty, and he put man, Adam, in the garden. And he then brought Eve to him, formed of his own rib. <laughs> it's just amazing. The whole picture of the garden is one of encounter, one of intimacy, one of deep, deep connection to God first, to each other, and then to creation. And we know that that's how it's going to be in the end. This deep connection, the final Adam, Jesus, has made it possible for us to walk in fullness of life. And just as Adam and Eve in the beginning were righteous, they had beautiful fellowship with God. So we we know it's going to happen. <laughs> it's a matter just of time. There will be a moment when you and I will be together with him again for eternity in the same beautiful union. He talks about Adam and Eve becoming one, and it's like a bride and a bridegroom. And we hear through amazing, through the words of John at the end, the bride waits for the bridegroom, and it's a wedding feast. The same, same beautiful ingredients. I want us just to have a look here at one thing. There were two trees in that Eden. There was a tree of life, and then there was a testing tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I want you to sit, as you listen to me, thinking your choices in life are that. He's giving you the tree of life, the abundance, the fruit, the nourishment. But often there are times of testing too. And if we fall for it and do the wrong thing, then we have really missed the mark. And we are experiencing the consequences of our disobedience, which is the curse. So in that beginning, we had this beautiful image of paradise, completely shattered, catastrophic, because of disobedience and the curse. And this is the theme that we'll go through 
Let's look quickly at Isaiah 51. I love this from the NIV. It says in um, verse 3, the Lord will surely comfort Zion, will look with compassion on all her ruins. And that's our lives so often. We feel we're in the middle of ruins and rubble. We've done things wrong. But look at his love. <laughs> he looks with compassion. He will surely comfort Zion. Do you see that that's what's just motivating him always? He will make her deserts like Eden. It's a beautiful picture that Isaiah gives. Her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. This is the garden. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. And I really want to challenge you as I challenge myself, if we're not experiencing joy in spite of circumstance, we might be in the wasteland, we might be in the rubble, but he's doing a new thing inside of us. And if we don't have that joy, I want us to think why, what is the block? Let him comfort you, let him love you. Let him look with compassion at you. Let him make your desert like Eden, your wasteland like a garden of the Lord. His transformative work is always at powerfully ministering to us if we are open to receive him. Let's look again at Isaiah 58, verse 11 from the Amplified. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your soul in scorched and dry places. So it's not that you're going to get out of them, but it's in them. Do you see? <laughs> in the scorched and dry places. That's what I'm experiencing so often. It's not that he takes you out of it and wafts along the mountain. It's in it, in the grit and grime. That's where you honestly can experience his love and his joy. And look at this. He will give strength to your bones. I love that. <laughs> And you will be like a watered garden. Some translations say a well-watered garden. Like a spring of water whose waters don't fail. They just keep gurgling and sprouting up. That's what we experience as believers. And that's this beautiful picture of the garden. And it's throughout the whole of Scripture. And I believe he's saying to us today, if you're not experiencing a walk in a garden with him, even in your secret moments where no one's watching, May he reveal to you as he works through revealing his word through the Holy Spirit, what is causing the block to let that happen, that intimacy of connection. Song of Songs, I love. If you ever doubt the love of God, Song of Songs is sandwiched right in the middle. It's passionate. It's true love. It's beautiful love. And it's again this theme of the bride and the bridegroom, the shepherd king loving his bride. And you know what he calls his bride? A garden of delight. Isn't that beautiful? He sees her as a garden of delight. And this is exactly what we read in Isaiah. He makes us a well-watered garden. He transforms the wasteland, the desert, into a beautiful garden in our hearts where we allow him to do so. The beloved is a beautiful picture of Christ, the bridegroom, and the bride, the Shulamite, talks about his garden, and he looks at her and he says, my garden. Isn't that beautiful? That's the intimacy of connection there. So the garden is enclosed. It means it's completely dedicated for him. It's watered, it's fragrant, it's fruitful, and it's refreshing with all of its streams. Oh, may we be that. <laughs> and if you think it's just the Old Testament, Paul, this amazing scholar, brought up in Rome, studied under Gamaliel, a real scholar, had such an encounter with Jesus. He writes this, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, the Amplified, you are God's garden. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> It's throughout scripture. So in the beginning and at the end, in Genesis, Revelation, and all the way through, this is the theme. Let's be that garden. Let's have that intimacy of relationship and oneness with him, with his fruitfulness and fragrance that not only impacts our little world, but far-reaching, 
far-reaching. The key moments in Scripture have a garden. I'm just going to look at that quickly. We've looked at the beginning in Genesis where there was this beautiful paradise of oneness which was lost, broken. And we've looked at Revelation where it's restored. We're righteous again. The curse is removed. And it's beautiful oneness. But look at the two key places in Scripture that are absolutely life-changing for history. The Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus sweat drops of blood because of the cross that lay ahead. The Garden of Gethsemane, of deep suffering and pain because he bore our sins. And then let's look at the next garden in John 20. Mary at the resurrection. <laughs> the cross, the resurrection, in the middle of these scriptures are the key gardens. No accident. She's in a garden. And when she first sees Jesus, she thinks he's a gardener. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Do you feel that he's wanting you to go deeper with him? To just experience his love as you've never been loved before. It's all the way through in the garden. Do a study yourself on it. It's just amazing. Intimacy with God, oneness with God. But we have to be righteous to have that. So if there's something causing a block that you're feeling shamed, ashamed about, release that to him. We're going to have a time at the end where I'm going to ask you to reflect and I'm going to ask you to repent, which is turn around. And I'm going to ask you to just release. And then I'm going to ask you to receive. And then I'm going to ask you to allow him to renew. I'm going to just go through those with you. But just as you're sitting there, reflect on these deep truths. He's saying this repeatedly for a reason. Let's move on to the tree, because I love the trees. When he first describes Eden in in Genesis, he talks about the garden, and the next verse talks about trees. (laughs) Trees are key, and it's the tree of life. And I've spoken already about the tree of life, which is nurturing and nourishing, and they could have fed for eternity on that. But then there was this testing tree, and they fell. And in Scripture, there are always this choice of which tree you're going to be. I'm going to go quickly through this, but do a study yourself. It's amazing. But through it, bring in relationship of oneness because what he's saying to you is life-changing. Let's look at Psalm 1, such a familiar passage. Blessed is the one. In some versions, it says to be congratulated is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked. You've got this choice of contrast doesn't stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. So delight is not a showy, out-of-side thing. It's just that stirring inside of you when no one's looking and no one sees that you actually have the surge of delight in his law, in his word, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, It yields its fruit in season. Its leaf doesn't wither, and whatever they do prospers. That's an extraordinary contrast. Mocking, not going anywhere. And those who really trust God, who think about him, who live in him, they will prosper. You may not see it immediately, but deep within, you prosper because you are connected to life itself. Streams of water. And I always think a tree is like this. You see the little top part, but you don't know what's under the ground. (laughs) And if those roots are strong and going into living water, even when the drought comes up at the top and there's heat and strong winds, you're not going to be knocked over. You're going to stand strong because your roots are deep. That's Psalm 1. Two different contrasts, and it's very powerful in Jeremiah 17. Um, I don't know that there's time actually to go through this, but it just says, 
There are two types of trees in Jeremiah 17, verses 5 to 8, and I really encourage you to look at that. It talks about the one who trusts in himself, who thinks he is or she is the big deal. They don't bother about trusting God, but they really put all of their puffed up pride in self. And I think a lot of people are living that way simply because they don't know there's another way to live. They just believe self-improvement, self-choice, you can do it. But what Jeremiah is saying here is what they're really like is a stunted shrub in a barren wilderness on a salt-encrusted plain. Very strong language. A stunted shrub and a barren wilderness in a salt-encrusted plain. They don't have life. But the one who trusts in God, who really clings to God, relies on God, is like a tree planted again by the waters. And it spreads its roots into the river. And even when heat comes and drought, it's not going to be afraid. It won't be anxious. And it will not stop bearing fruit. And its leaf will not wither. Now, these are two pictures of choices, and I just want to encourage you, throughout the day, we have uncountable decisions to make. What do we eat? What do we wear? Who do we speak to? Who do we phone? What do we look at? May you choose life. May you put your roots into where the living water is, draw up nourishment, and may you bear fruit. And then I have to mention Galatians 3, 13. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Because again, we come back to the cross. On the cross, Jesus took on himself everything that separates us from this wonderful love relationship with God. God never stops loving us, but we can't respond when we're all clogged up. And Jesus took that. It reflects Deuteronomy 21, 23, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. There's your tree again. Jesus took that sin so that you could be free, free to put roots into the living water and to produce his fruit. Your choice. I pray that you choose life and experience his abundance. So the tree of life is mentioned three times in Genesis and it's mentioned four times in the book of Revelation. Isn't that extraordinary? That Moses, writing this in Sinai and John on Patmos, would say those exact same words, the beginning, the end, the tree of life. And for those of us who really believe, who just say, Lord, fill me, use me, transform me, make me righteous, And we know that that happens when, by faith, we do receive him through the Holy Spirit. Then we will walk in the fullness of what we experience in Revelation, the tree of life. Revelation 2.7 says, in the new earth, we will eat freely of the same fruit, the tree of life that nourished Adam and Eve before it all went wrong. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? The tree of life. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Oh, my heart just feels his love for you saying, come and eat. (laughs) I've prepared all of this for you. Don't miss out. Then we come to the river. We sang about that today. Oh, the river, the river. Water is life. I've spent a lot of my time in South Africa working in very poor, needy communities, remote communities. I've lived in a tribal hut. I've um, got to know the tribal chiefs and had to go and fetch water from a well, and there were no toilets or anything fancy like that. So it was a very stark wake-up call to see how millions of people are living, really. But water is life. And clean water is vital. There's so many waterborne diseases. Water is life. So can you imagine living water? (laughs) Living water that doesn't run out and that satisfies. You don't get thirsty again and brings abundance. Wow, I love that. So looking at Eden, 
In the Garden of Eden, there were four rivers. Did you know that? Not just one. I'm going to run through them quickly because the names are very interesting. The, the first one, and it's very significant, is Pishon, and it means fast-flowing, full-flowing. It's full of increase, Pishon. So it's a river of increase. It's full-flowing. It's not stagnant. And I just see in the New Testament, this theme is caught. Ephesians 3.19, Paul prayed that believers would be filled with the fullness of God. There it is. John 1.16, John spoke of Jesus saying, out of his fullness, his abundance, we have all received. Abundance upon abundance, spiritual blessing on spiritual blessing, favor on favor. Can you feel it? <laughs> it's a fullness. That's the first river in Eden. If you're not experiencing fullness, why? What is the, pl the block? Take time to reflect as I speak. If you know what it is, I ask you, repent, turn around from that. And then just release it, don't carry it. And then receive his forgiveness, receive who he is, and let him renew you. So that's Pishon. The next one is interesting, it's slightly different, and it's Gihon, and it is bursting forth or gushing. You might think it's fairly similar because the first one was full flowing, but this one isn't just full and flowing, it's actually bursting. Let us switch it off. My goodness. I was going to say, woe is me, I'm undone. But <laughs> anyway, I didn't mean to burst out quite so much. Thank you, Trevor. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry. But you'll never forget Gihon, <laughs> the river that burst. <laughs> so it's different from Fishon because Fishon is just full and flowing, full of increase, but Gihon, and I believe as we step into the river and go deeper and deeper with him, we will experience that bursting out, because that is what impacts other people. It really does. If we're just going along our own little way, it's one thing, but if we are bursting out, it really does affect those around us. Um, and Jesus says to the woman at the well, and we're going to come to it a bit later, he says that I will give you living water, like an artisan spring that is just gushing forth like a fountain from within you. Those are his words. This theme is repeated in scripture for a reason. He wants us to have it. <laughs> he wants us to live it. And if you're not, let's reflect, repent. Let's just release whatever it is that blocks. And let's receive what he has and let him renew. The third river is the Tigris. We know the Tigris and the Euphrates. Those are the last two, sometimes called Hittichel. But it's swift or darting. And I love that one because it's swift, it's clear, it's strong, but it has a purpose, it has a goal. And again, that you read that over and over in scripture, we have a goal. We are going for the prize of the high calling of Christ. In Mark 11 and James 4, it's very clear that we are to pray specifically with purpose. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, I run with purpose in every step. We need to be intentional. We need to take this seriously, that what he's saying is the right way to live. We can't be sloppy in these last days. There's no time to be sloppy. The fourth river, the Euphrates, is beautiful. It is sweet and fruitful. That's what Euphrates means. So look at all those qualities in this living water. Isn't it wonderful? Fullness, gushing, overflowing, impacting others. Swift with a purpose, effective, and sweet and fruitful. 
2 Corinthians 2, 14, Paul says, spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. And living in that living water, that's what we'll be able to do, not in our own strength. So I couldn't talk about deeper still without talking about Ezekiel 47. And I'm going to close with this. Ezekiel 47, just quickly, if we look at a snapshot of the conditions of the day, God had freed the slaves, brought them out of bondage, built them up in a new land, given them a city, Jerusalem, had a temple, given them a place of worship where he encountered them. But then again, it just went wrong. There was corruption in worship. The kingdoms were divided. <sighs> And once again, there was failure. And so the northern kingdom fell to Assyria, the southern kingdom to Babylon, and the people of God were in exile. So in Ezekiel 47, this chapter that I'm going to look at as we close, this is the lowest pit for the, the people of Israel at that time. This prophecy was given by Ezekiel 25 years into exile was halfway through because there was like two generations where they were living in exile. And we thought, what have we done wrong? Oh God, it's our fault. We are living under a curse. Here we go again. <laughs> Such a familiar story. But it's extraordinary. Remember I said, he constantly wants to show us his love. He never stops loving no matter what happens, who we are, where we've been, what we've done. Well, here we see it in the most extraordinary way. Ezekiel 47. As he's praying and God tells him to prophesy, what happens? There's a little trickle from the sanctuary, like a little teardrop of grace trickling from behind the altar. That's what Ezekiel sees in this dry, desolate place. And I must quickly say that scholars have described the seven chapters before Ezekiel 47 as some of the driest, literally <laughs> dullest chapters ever written in the Bible because it just talks about the details of the temple. And you think, really? And then comes Ezekiel 47, this teardrop of grace trickling. And wow, wow. What happens? <laughs> it's amazing. The water starts to trickle. And Ezekiel is writing how in a thousand cubits, which is about a third of the mile, it goes from this tiny trickle to ankle deep. <laughs> and then another thousand cubits, it's knee deep. And another thousand cubits, it's waist deep. The water's starting to flow. He gets this picture of renewal, of life, of living water in the middle of absolute devastation and hopelessness. And then the waters gather so that it is a river that you have to swim in and jump in. <laughs> you can't even walk to the other side. And I love this picture because I believe God's saying that to us today as we are here. The sanctuary, the place of prayer, sacrifice, commitment. Let me come to your garden. Let me be with you like a tree that's putting its root into water. Let me let my living waters flow through you as this picture of Ezekiel. Maybe you are just putting your toe in. Maybe you've actually gone into the knees. Maybe you have gone very timidly up to the waist and you think that's fine. I want to jump in. <laughs> I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper and deeper still because there's more and more of him to experience. And as we surrender all those blocks, silly little things, really, they're not worth it, and allow ourselves to be refreshed and renewed by him, transformation begins, and living water trickles, and it impacts not just ourselves, our families, our communities, but the whole wide world in ways you wouldn't ever imagine. Let's close our eyes and pray as we close. Loving Lord, loving Lord, thank you for this time when we've looked at your word, at the garden, the place of intimacy, 
that it's the beginning of Scripture and it's going to be at the close of Scripture. Thank you for this beautiful picture of intimacy and oneness with you. Thank you for the tree, the picture of the tree that Jesus hung on a tree on a cross. It took everything that stopped us from having oneness with you. Thank you that we can be like trees, fruitful, nourishing those around us. And thank you especially for the river, the living water. Everything where the river goes will live. And the man Jesus, the person Jesus, whoever you touch will live as we've sung today. Thank you that when you spoke to the woman at the well, you said, out of your belly will flow, gushing to eternal life, rivers of water. Thank you that in the great day of the festival that you said with a loud voice in John 7, whoever is thirsty, come and drink. And you were talking about the Holy Spirit. Everywhere, everything touched by you will live with a surging, fragrant, overflowing waters that are alive. Come into our areas of chaos, frustration, futility, and may we go deeper and deeper in you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like prayer afterwards, we would be so willing to see the Lord working in your life, that you would reflect, that you would seriously look at these aspects, that you would repent and turn if need be, and that you would allow him to just take whatever is your burden from you, release it, don't carry it, and then let him refresh you, renew you, recharge you, make you one in intimacy with him forever and ever. <laughs> and as I close, I just love the way, the beginning he says, come to me. And if you read in Revelation chapter 22, the bride and the spirit say to him, come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, amen.